Okay. All right, it is 7.03 p.m. and uh, we will get started now. Okay, let's see. Uh, all right, just uh, wait a few little things here. Okay, all right, let's get started. So welcome everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this webinar hosted by the Cybersecurity Nonprofit. My name is Ronaldo Gonzalez and I lead the CSMP Houston chapter. As a member of CSMP, we are dedicated to promoting cybersecurity education, awareness, and training to be accessible to everyone. So by hosting these free events for the community uh, on behalf of CSMP and myself from the Houston chapter, we want to be able to build a very supportive, diverse, and inclusive culture for cybersecurity and the community. If you wish to learn more, please do visit our website at csmp.org and connect with us on various social media platforms. Anyone with an interest in cybersecurity is welcome to join and volunteer for CSNP, for CSNP if you want to join for these events or even for becoming into a more uh, joining to a more active role and be part of something important and something very interesting. So we look, we really uh, really appreciate uh, you all joining us here in this virtual event. Uh, this is a very exciting way to connect uh, with others and share this uh, great experience. So first, on um, behalf and uh, CSMP, we want to thank our sponsors to uh, GuardiCore, Security Innovation, uh, Elastic, and Contrast Security. Uh, thank you for making these events possible for the community and for helping us to uh, provide these uh, virtual events as well. Uh, don't miss our upcoming next two events. Uh, we have our, uh, on May 13th, A Day in the Life of a CISO with uh, Randall Fritzsche. And then we also have on May 19th uh, with uh, doing with David Lee on the event of piloting the Linux terminal. So this will be very interesting events. Uh, if you have not signed up and you want to join, uh, the links are posted here. Feel free to join us and take part in those events. Now, today's interesting topic is called our Data Protection 101, an introduction to data protection with our guest speaker, Carolina Rupa Calva Schaffer. This webinar will look at ways to reduce risk of data loss and give some tips on how to get into the data protection field where data protection should be in everyone's mind, not just for corporations, but also for individuals. Now, we might think that our data and information is not valuable, but it is actually worth more than we think. So it's important to, to understand that. And now our guest speaker, Carolina, she's a senior manager for the data protection and insider threat team at United Airlines. In her role, Carolina ensures that an appropriate level of data and privacy compliance is met for the organization. Prior to United, Carolina worked in application development at Nisource, a power company in Indiana. There she was one of the two women in the IT department she has over 10 years of experience in various information technology areas. She holds a bachelor's of science degree in information technology from Purdue University. She was originally from Mexico, but resides in Indiana. Along with taking on challenges in the cybersecurity world, she also provides mentoring to many interested people in the field of cybersecurity. As an advocate for diversity and cybersecurity, Carolina, Carolina has mentored several young adults that participated in the nonprofit program called the Year Up at United Airlines. Many of these young adults have moved on to do big things in the cyber world with very interesting and satisfying cybersecurity roles. She also holds networking events with a close friend to talk about her culture and share the experiences of a Latina woman in the corporate world. Carolina has learned to balance work and personal life as a mom with three kids and two puppies. She loves spending time with her family and attending sports events. So uh, during this event, uh, during this presentation, I ask that the audience please be courteous, respectful, professional to the speaker and to each other. We will have about 10 minutes at the end for any questions that you can post on the Q&A section. Uh, please post them there. And, um, and then we'll go ahead and address those questions uh, once uh, we go through, through the presentation. Uh, now, without further delay, I hand it over to Carolina Schaffer. Thank you. Thank you, Reynaldo, for the introduction and thank you for having me today. So let me uh, share my screen. One second. Okay. 
Okay. And can you see my screen? Uh, not, not yet. How about now? Um, nope. <laughs> no, we, okay. we just saw it a moment ago. <laughs> a little, okay, there little, you go. There we go. There it is. Three times the charm. <laughs> yes. All right, you're good now. Okay, so there you go. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is just introduction to data protection. Now, what I'm going to say in this webinar is, is in my opinion, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not giving any advice, it's just purely based on research that I've done in my experiences. So let me, uh, next slide. So what is data protection? Sometimes data protection is also referred as uh, information privacy, just privacy or data security. But it's basically the process of protecting the confidentiality, integrity, and data availability of important information, whatever that's important you know, to a company or whether it's important to you. For, uh, any, for organizations that handle sensitive data, uh, they must implement the data protection, uh, data protection strategy to prevent uh, the theft, corruption, or loss of their data and mitigate against the damage in case of a security breach or um, a disaster. So data protection is important because when data that should be kept private gets in the wrong hands, bad things can happen. Some examples, uh, let's say there's a data breach in a government agency, you know, top secret information can be in the hands of the enemy state. Uh, we, we can also go to the breach in the corporate world, you know, I can put proprietary information in the hands of a competitor. Uh, a breach at a school could put students' PII in the hands of criminals and they can commit identity theft. Um, so that's basically, you know, um, a summary of what data protection is. So, uh, you know, sometimes it gets confusing. So data protection, data security, or data privacy, right? So basically data protection um, should be in, the, in your strategy. Now data security is uh, the strategy that would enforce the policy. So it's like the more technical work that we need to do. And then data privacy focus more on, on those laws, right? Like those regulations and, um, and uh, yeah. So it's a combination of cybersecurity and the legal team. So some examples of uh, this data protection regulations. Um, this is why, you know, now we have, uh, uh, have to enforce some of the security and some of this controls. So it all started with the US Privacy Act in 1974. And since then, I mean, so you can see in, in my slide, there's been a, a whole new, you know, laws and regulations that have come up over the years, which is making it very complex for businesses to stay compliant. And it's just getting harder and harder. So uh, there's a, a need for uh, cybersecurity professionals to get educated in the space, even if you're not in the, in the data protection um, area. Okay, so why do we care about privacy? Why is it so important, right? Um, so privacy, uh, privacy rights prevent the government from spying on people without a cause. Uh, privacy rights keep groups from using personal data for their own goals. Privacy rights helps ensure that uh, those who still may use the data are, are held accountable. They also help maintain social boundaries uh, build trust, you know, with companies, ensure we have control over our data. Uh, it protects the freedom of speech and speech and thought. And privacy rights let you engage freely in politics. They protect reputation, so people and companies, and it protects uh, your finances as well. Okay, so the value of the data. So this is something we don't think about. I have heard people say, oh, I don't care if they steal my information. They're, I have nothing valuable, right? But your data alone is valuable. That's what now it's being targeted. I, I read in some article that data, it's gonna be the new oil. I don't know how true that is, but it was very interesting to read. So the data on the uh, dark market. So if you see in this slide, I'll give you an idea of 
so this is from, of course, attackers stealing your data, you know, doing those data breaches. So why do they want it? Because they can get money for it, right? So um, as you can see um, in this uh, slide, it depends also on what, the amount of data that get, they're getting. And that's why it's important to encrypt it. So whenever they do steal something, they can't use it. But let's say if they steal um, a credit card, right? A credit card number, it's war, it might be worth less if they steal the credit card number with the expiration date and the CSV on the back. So the dark web price index in 2020, according to uh, um, privacy affairs, um, is averaging, uh, for example, online banking, login cost, an average of $25 per person. So that's just lo your login information. Person's full credit card detail, including associated data cost between $12 to $20. And um, a full range of documents and account details allowing identity theft can be obtained for like $1,200. And this is for sale. According to some you know, articles I was reading, it says your data is already for sale. So it's just a matter of time. I know it's pretty scary, right? Um, so um, let me see, go to the next one. Oh, one other one that I wanted to mention, Gmail accounts are also at a high price right now. So they are averaging about $156 in the dark web. So protect your email accounts, your any account that you have, right? Just make sure that you are practicing um, uh, safe uh, security standards. So it is worth more than you think. So this that's the price for people that are hacking, right? Like they're using your company, they're criminals, and that's how much they get for it. But actually companies and businesses are making a lot more than what hackers are making with your data. Um, so have you ever felt like if someone's listening to your phone, like you say something and then you see all this ads popping up, like in your yeah. social media accounts? Well, you can think uh, targety, targeting companies like, you know, the big tech companies, right? Um, you, so your personal data is also for sale. So those, those big companies are collecting your data and you agree for them to do this when you created your account. And we'll go into the privacy policies later. Um, so basically they're using your data and then they're selling it to third party companies. So um, they use this data for various reasons. You know, it can be for research, just to know how to target you. Um, and some of the articles that I was reading are saying that it's, it's billions of dollars, right, that companies are making with your data. And I actually saw that there's, um, there's a, um, a group in, I believe, California, that now they're saying, hey, you made money with our data. We want some of that money. So I guess there's going to be lawsuit going on. I don't know how that's going to end up. But it was very interesting if you think about it. Um, yes, we agreed to give them the data, but we didn't agree for them to re you know, invest it, right? So, um, in a recent report estimated that collective revenue of digital advertising companies in the US um, is about the, the information that is collected from an adult is worth about $35 per month. So just imagine and multiply that by millions of, of people, right? So how are they collecting this data? So there, there are different strategies, right, for collecting quantitative data. And some of them are surveys, you know, surveys that we may, may be filling out on, you know, our social media platforms, quizzes, questionnaires, I also see that a lot. Um, online tracking as a data collection technique. So your mobile app, Everything, every application that you downloaded to your phone is collecting some type of data and then it's feeding it to your phone. Uh, and then from there, you know, it's just a circle. You know, the big tech companies are grabbing that. Uh, transactional data as well. Um, online marketing um, analytics as well. What you're buying, what you're not buying, you know, the stores. Um, 
something else that I, I now if you go to any store, they, they ask you to create an account with them. So you put in your phone number and they give you coupons and this and that. But at the same time, they're also learning a lot about you. What are you buying? And uh, they know also how to target you and, and, and um, with, with the coupons or whatever else, you know, it's needed. Um, social media monitoring, you know, most social media accounts, they're collecting some, some type of data. And then, you know, subscriptions and registrations of data as well. Um, and store traffic monitoring is the one that I just mentioned, you know, going into the stores physically. And then when you're paying, you're putting, you know, your number in there. Then if you don't put your number, if you use your credit card, then they're also tracking, not your credit card number, but the customer, right? That is using that card. Um, so next, we go into privacy policies. So yes, we are agreeing for all these companies to collect our data. They present to us privacy policies that are very hard to read. You know, that can be super long. And even if you go through the entire team, is thing is very hard to sometimes understand what they're really gonna do with, with our data. Um, so while each privacy law will have some different requirements, all of them require some sort of privacy notice or disclosure, right? So now almost, even on, if you go to sites, uh, you even have to uh, allow for them to collect your data via the cookies or whatever it is, right? So we, now is by law, you have to have some type of privacy policy. So the privacy policy is a statement or a legal document that states how a company or website collects or handles and processes data of its customers and visitors. It explicitly describes whether that information is kept confidential or is shared or sold to a third party. Uh, the privacy policy should disclose how that company can be contacted, uh, the personal information that they have to collect, how they're gonna collect it, how they're gonna use it, how they share it, use of rights regarding, and all of the above. So what are you able to do? Like, can you call them and say, I need you to delete all of my data? Um, that should also be, you know, what rights do you have, right? Or if you wanna request, right, a transcript of or whatever information they have all of you and all of that. So we just have to make sure that we reading, every time we download an app to our phone, we have to make sure we go through all the privacy policies. And if you access something that does not have a privacy policy, if do not download it, do not access it, just do a little more research or maybe find another, another option. Okay, so how to protect yourself. So there are many different ways that you can protect yourself. So the most famous one, of course, the use of passwords. Um, but it has to be strong passwords. Um, so, you know, whether do not reuse the same password. So if you create a password for your email, make sure that you're creating a different password for your bank account, right? Um, you can use a password keeper. I think that's the best way to keep track and remember complex passwords for um, numerous accounts. Um, do not share your passwords or do not write them down, including on paper. Yes, you know, it happens. Um, password protect all confidential data as well. So if you must save something that has confidential data, at least password protect it. Um, and never save passwords on your device. Um, something else that you can do to protect yourselves is avoid unnecessary, unnecessary exposure. So be careful with the information that you share on your social media network, especially. Avoid posting data about where you live, such as your address and phone number. There's, I have seen Facebook accounts that are private, but when you go and look at the about, like the details, they make their birthday public and they make where they live public their emails public. So just with that, I just collected so much information about them. Uh, I have no intentions of using it, but you know, people that are out to get you, this, this are ways that they can get your information. Um, avoid risk uh, with exposure is always disconnect from GPS. 
So most of the apps are tracking our location. I know, you know, it can be tedious to go into each of the applications and make sure that it's not, it's not tracking your location, but you can do that, or you can disable the GPS altogether from your phone. Uh, make sure you turn off your Bluetooth as well when you're not using it and beware of public Wi-Fi. If you must use public Wi-Fi, uh, please use VPN. Um, be careful uh, with risky downloads because, you know, we, they, you, um, you have the risk of downloading malware into your um, phone or your computer. And remember always to read the terms and conditions before installing an application and service, including the privacy policy. And always use antivirus. And, you know, that's for obvious reasons. We want to make sure we're scanning our systems, including our phones. Okay, so I have more ways to protect yourself. <laughs> so um, backup culture. So keep a uh, backup of your very important documents on the cloud. So that way, if you lose your laptop, you have a copy of your documents in a very secure uh, place. Uh, if you're a victim of identity theft, you know, um, you still have your documents, you know, um, in, a, in, in a cloud environment. And then updates are important. Update your systems, your computers, and make sure you have, because that's gonna install security patches and it's gonna uh, remediate those vulnerabilities that you might have. Uh, use encryptions. I know many applications today already um, use encryptions in their messages, but um, any, if you have the option, if you, um, if you, the system that you're using offers encryption, please always opt to use it. And avoid programs using um, that do not use encryption, especially in collaboration tools like file sharing, um, instant messaging, email. Um, yeah, just to name a few. And do not share your confidential data. Evaluate the confidential data that you share. Uh, look at all your social media accounts and just evaluate what you have and what is need to be shared, what does not need to be shared. Make sure you make it public. Only provide information on a need to know basis. Always question uh, why someone's requesting personal information from you or sensitive data. And be mindful of the confidential data you keep and why you keep it. So those are some tips on how to protect yourself. So next, how to uh, protect uh, your business, right, for your company. So if you, once we go over this, you're gonna see it's very similar to the way that you should be protecting your data. So there's really no secret, you know, um, I guess companies have to protect it the same way and take this, almost the same precautions as us. So for companies, I mean, write up a strategy, rather, the, rather than having a vague idea of a policy and procedure, just make sure you have a formal strategy you create those policies and procedures and make sure you socialize them right with everybody. Uh, protect against malware, which, you know, antivirus, uh, whatever it is it that you need to do, uh, please make sure you're enforcing that. Um, apply the firewall. We're not enough on it on its own, but uh, a route on, on, on board firewall provides the first line of defense. Uh, so turn it on. See, so keep Oops. Keep your wireless network secure as well. So that's another one. Safeguard your passwords. So the same as us. Make sure you safeguard your passwords. Uh, even sometimes as simple as a password can be uh, compromised to um, fortify your data. They might be uh, um, they might be hard to remember, but you know, complex passwords is the way to go. Create a plan for your personal devices. Uh, more common in small to medium businesses, but make sure you stay, um, you know, on top of the the security risk associated with employees bringing in and using their own devices. And create a plan for the practice in order to provide some protection against legal repercussions and mobile system costs. So a clear, comprehensive policy covering pertaining data, deletion, location, tracking, and internet monitoring issues can be very valuable. Um, next is set up automatic software updates and as you know, applies to us as well. Just make sure you're 
oh, so where's up to date? And you, you know, you always have the latest version. Now this one, conduct background checks. So you might not think of this one, you know, when you think of data protection, but be extra vigilant with regards to hiring new employees. Safeguarding against internal threats plays a key, a key role in effective cybersecurity. So look into the background and give yourself an idea of what kind of person they are. Additionally, be mindful of changes in character of existing employees as this could be an indicative of other issues. So this will be more in the insider threat area. So this pose of data properly as well. Uh, having uh, the appropriate measures in place to dispose of data, which is no longer required, is very critical factor in reducing the risk of security breach. So um, also apply retention policies as well, uh, where needed, especially email, documents, you know, in your company. But um, having those uh, so data destruction policies uh, are very important to have. Uh, use the cloud. If your business doesn't have the time or expertise to stay on top of all the security issues and updates requiring attention, then it might be worth looking into a cloud server, service provider. And educate your employees finally. So making sure everyone in your business understands company security policy is important, whether you opt to do it during onboarding or you know, bi-weekly refreshers or whatever it is, just make sure everyone is heading the practice through the entire company. Okay, so now we go into, do you want to be part of a data protection team? So um, there are many different roles here. I only included uh, a hint, you know, a few of them, but if you search the web, you'll find many, many other roles. This will, to me, it will be the, the most critical ones. So data privacy officer, which that's usually, um, uh, in the legal team, part of the legal team, so you must you have to be an attorney, privacy attorney as well, data protection analyst that would be in the cybersecurity team, then there's data security engineers, analysts, specialists, data privacy security managers, or you know, um, privacy engineers, analysts, architects, and then also cybersecurity governance and risk and compliance. Um, manager or analyst as well and data loss prevention dlp either analyst uh, engineer and specialist everybody has a very specific um, um, role some are more technical than others but everything um, all of these roles are in part of the either grc or data protection teams so if you're interested in learning more um, i urge you to uh, maybe look into this and maybe you'll want to want to join a team soon, but you say, okay, so I want to join it, but I don't know how, right? Like I have IT experience, or maybe I have some legal experience, but how do I make this switch? So some of the things that I can, I can recommend, get familiar with uh, frameworks, for example, NIST, NIST, there's a NIST, uh, NIST framework now has a privacy area, uh, which, um, was added uh, in 2019. So get familiar with the frameworks, um, pursue some certifications, for example, um, the certified information privacy professional, certified in data protection, certified information privacy manager, information uh, privacy technology, data privacy solutions engineer. So like I said, some of these are more technical than others, but it depends on, on what you're looking for. And then some places, a, a good place to start will be the IAPP uh, organization. Uh, there you can find um, a lot of training. Some of it, um, I believe it's free. And then some of it you can register. And usually they're like six week courses. The same thing with the uh, information system and audit, audit and control association. You can find a lot of training there. Now, if you wanna take it up a notch, there's a master program, uh, privacy engineering program, Carnegie Mellon University. So they have a master's program, but they also have a certificate program. So the certificate program, I think is about um, eight weeks uh, or obtain a master's in cybersecurity. That would also get you your foot in the door. Uh, one program that I know about is with Georgia Tech. 
So it's a 10 course program and it's only $10,000 total. So you don't have to spend tons of money to get exposure and training into um, this field. Okay, so I also want to take this opportunity to talk about women and cybersecurity. So women are highly underrepresented in the field of cybersecurity. In 2017, women's share in the U.S. cybersecurity field was only 14% compared to 48 in the general workforce. The problem is more accurate to the U.S. Um, um, women accounted for 10% of the cybersecurity workforce, while in other regions like Asia, Africa, Latin America, it's even lower. So you see, uh, it, you know, uh, it goes from like nine, eight, seven, even 5%. Women are even less well represented in the upper um, um, org chart, right, on security leadership. So only 1% of females um, are senior managers in senior manager positions. So out of the 1%, uh, you can just imagine what's the percent of Latinas, right? So women are also generally not represented with opportunities in information technology fields. And in a survey of women pursuing careers outside of IT field said that 69% indicated that the main reason they didn't pursue opportunities in IT or cyber is because they were not aware of them. They didn't know it was an option or they didn't know much about it. So increasing women's participation in cybersecurity is a business issue as well as a gender issue. And according to Ernest and Young report, by 2028, women will control 75% of discretionary consumer spending worldwide. And that's why we need more women. Security considerations like encryption, fraud detection biometrics are becoming important in consumers buying decisions. And we need women to have a seat on that table. So, um, so there, I mean, I mentioned a master's in cybersecurity, so it's a worth it, right? It's a worth it for you to invest the time and the money. So there are many reasons why a degree in cybersecurity is worth investing in. Uh, in fact, you could say there are 3.5 million reasons. So that's the estimated number of unfilled cybersecurity jobs in this year alone, according to the New York Times. So the fastest growing uh, uh, security cyber security skills for 2021 and beyond. So according to Burning Glass Technology, the 10 fastest growing cybersecurity skills are, um, I'm sorry, the 10 uh, fastest cybersecurity skills show employers are ready to pay more for workers who are equipped to prevent attacks before they occur. So um, these skills, uh, let me just, uh, okay, so um, sorry for the confusion here, but according to the US um, labor statistics of information security analysts, so, the jobs that are going to be the hottest within cybersecurity are uh, application development security. So within the next five years, it's going to grow 164%. Okay. So um, cloud security is going to grow 115%. Risk management, 60%. Threat intelligence, 41%. Incident response, 37 Compliance and controls, 36 Data privacy and security, 36%. Access, access management is 32 And strategy, security strategy and governance is 20%. So although these jobs are highly technical, the demand is not limited to the information technology sector. For example, pro, uh, data privacy and security is one of those jobs that you don't necessarily have to be as technical. So, um, so just keep this in mind, please consider it. Um, the demand is really high. So we want all men and women, but I wanna encourage all women to, to at least think about it, join the field or talk to other people, talk to your daughters, uh, spread the word. And uh, we need more women, but we also need more people in the cybersecurity field. We need to fill these jobs. So thank you.
this concludes my presentation. I don't know if you have any questions. Right. Awesome. Thank you. This, this is actually very good, very informative. I really appreciate all the details and sharing your, your experience and your knowledge in this area. So um, really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, now there are there are some questions uh, from the audience, and there's some also that I got some some direct uh, uh, messages that, that I saw. So let me start off with a few uh, here from the Q and A. Uh, so one question is uh, earlier you mentioned about uh, using VPNs. So this one's question related to that. Um, so what are your thoughts on using VPNs for for data protection and privacy. What's what's the way to approach that, and and some suggestions, or how do we think about that from a, from a perspective of our own personal data, or even for for an organization? Yes, and you know what, VPN will creates that tunnel, right? To to uh, so uh, VPN creates another layer of privacy. So people, if anybody is, is trying to monitor our traffic and a public Wi-Fi, right? If you use VPN, they're not able to even, you know, even though you're they connect to the same network, they're not gonna be able to to capture any of that of that traffic or any other transactions, right, that are going going on. So you create that extra tunnel, right? Like how I see it is like you create a a container, I guess, and you create transact transactions there. And I feel like that's important for us to, you know, at work, we have the connected VPN, but, you know, like I mentioned, pretty much what we're doing at work, we should be doing it in our personal lives as well. So I think, you know, for, uh, for investing on VPN for your phone, investing on VPN for your, um, for yourself as well, when you're not at home, I think it's, it's a, a good investment. Good. Yeah. So, so I just want to add to that also. Uh, mm -hmm. The nice thing about the, the VPNs too is that when we establish a connection from our home environment to the VPN provider, then anything that we're doing on our browsing is kind of kind of masqueraded with anyone else using the same kind of VPN mm -hmm. exit. The only time it will make a difference is if, let's say, you're signed in to your Google account or some other uh, applications where using the VPN, then eventually, whether it's the government tracking you or if, if someone's trying to correlate your traffic, they can see, okay, you're using the VPN, but eventually they see all this other data that can maybe correlate and do some analysis to, to, to pinpoint some of that information to you. So, the, so, so one thought there too, is that when using VPN, the whole idea is to try to be uh, try to be anonymous in that sense. So don't stay signed in to your accounts. Yeah, you can log into a site, sure, but don't remain connected if you don't need to. Um, that is very true. I want to add something right now, though. I was reading as well that now browsers, I think Firefox, and this is not related to VPN, but now you can <laughs> install a container for social media. And I think it was particular for Facebook. So you, you install this container on your browser, and that's where you open. Facebook from, and it's not able to collect anything from your phone or your computer. You know, it's just, you, you open it in this uh, safe space. That's really cool, actually. That, that's, I think I heard something about that too. There's uh, another one. I don't know if this will be related to that one, but there's uh, Firefox supports a, a, a plugin um, extension that's uh, called a multi-tab container where you can have multiple tabs on your browser and each tab that's part of a, a profile, like you can have a work profile, a personal profile and some other random profile. So if you log in into this container, uh, if you open up another container and log into that one, it's gonna treat it as a, as a separate session from your own computer. So it's a nice way to separate the traffic. So if you get something malicious on one uh, or you get compromised, say something you visit, it stays contained within that tab, within that browser. So so that's actually, a, I remember seeing something about that. It's actually really cool. Yep. Um, Okay, uh, another question here. Uh, whenever you download something, um, I'm guessing here, like, uh, I guess relate to, um, I guess maybe an app or an application, what is something you look for in a privacy notice? What are things that stand out or gotchas that, that should help you see, this, see these things? So you should look for um, anything that's pertaining to your data. So what data will they be collecting? And most of most applications, they are collecting something, whether it's your location or your activity and everything's going to be listed there. Now, if they say we're going to be collecting 
uh, your first name, last name, or, or you know whatever you have saved in you know in your profile. And then they said you because some some privacy policies very clearly say we we will share we will share your your data right whatever you're collecting. So just make sure be aware of what they're collecting. And if uh, if they're disclaiming that they're gonna sell it. Now, if they're collecting, um, if they also claim that uh, they're gonna collect also third party data from other applications that you have installed, that's a red flag as well. So I would just pay attention to what they're collecting, uh, if they're grabbing data from other applications as well, and then what they intend to do if they're gonna be selling it. And then also, what are your rights? Are you able to call them and, and ask for um, that information, right? Like, what is it that you have collected of me and I want, because uh, in some companies you're able to request that profile of you just to see what they, what they have collected and what all the information that they have. And then also check and see if you're able to also request that they delete all records. You can do that now with, uh, well, GDPR, uh, that's European customers. They they able to call and request that you delete all your rec all their records, if that's what they chose chose to do. Yeah, that's very very good points. Uh, I, I remember hearing uh, this one uh, situation where uh, I don't I think it was an article I read that uh, someone posted a review of some application. I think it was an, an app, an iOS app, where they provided the terms and information, the privacy notice on these details, and it was supposed to be like a trial for some app or something. So I forget what it was, but the review said something about that that they were that they were saying they were going to collect this data, do this with your information, this and this information, and then at the very bottom of that privacy notice, they said if you if you read if you read this whole privacy and you got this far, use this code, you're going to get the application for free. And uh, that was actually a really interesting nice. uh, thing to hear. I don't know if it was a privacy notice or their terms and agreement, but but it's important that we look at those things. So like you mentioned, you, you want to look for for these areas, see what, what are you going to do with your information. And sometimes just going through it can provide, you know, a little Easter egg that, that you didn't expect. So uh, I think that's uh, interesting nice. to see that. Uh, another question here is, um, uh, what's your favorite type of antivirus or malware programs to help protect your, your information? I personally use McAfee. So with McAfee, um, you're able to even scan your email, your laptops. Um, you can also share with your family. So you can, and you can have it in multiple um, like devices as well. So I like McAfee. I also use... Uh, Malware Bytes as well. Malware Bytes is free. They also have a, 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 a version that you can extend as mm -hmm. well. Okay. Yeah, Very those awesome. are my, my, my choices. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of different options to, to use. I know like whenever, if I ever get infection on my, on my personal computer or, or my parents call me or something, I try to use a few different programs to try to find the virus because one engine may not find it and you find it with one or another one or two out of the three. And so, yeah, having, having a good variety is, is, is good options. Um, all right. Uh, another question here. So, so earlier you talked about saving your data into the cloud or, or your backups into the cloud. Uh, um, what about also in the sense of, of local storage? So, so if, if, is it correct to say that that do, do we consider cloud storage to be more secure for your data? Uh, are there are there any have there been data breaches against these types of, of cloud data storages? Uh, and what are some platforms you suggest that we could use for cloud storage? And then what about local storage? Should we consider that too or, or not? Yes. Yeah, so I mean, there has there have been breaches with uh, companies that are storing in the cloud. But um, for example, if you're gonna store in a Dropbox or OneDrive, what I would recommend is you buy, you know, you pay, you don't get the free version, even though the free version, um, most of the contents are encrypted as well. Make sure that they have MFA as well. So that your account cannot be uh, compromised. Now, cloud versus storing it um, on your device, on a removable media, I would say removable media could be safe, but it depends. We don't want you like, 
you know, uh, the use of USB devices and removal of media is also, you know, it gives me a little, you know, and un not anxiety, but it makes me a little nervous as well, right? Because it, if you're only using it from one computer to your uh, uh, removal of media, then that might work. If you're the only person that's using it, the problem is if you lose that, then you don't have any other copies of that data versus if you save it on the cloud, I mean, um, unless you forget your password and your security questions and uh, whatever other controls you put in place, I mean, there's always a way, right, to get your login information back. But my, my preference would be the cloud. But a cloud account, that is not the, the watered down version. I would probably pay a little money to get that extra security. And it would be with the top company for example, like Dropbox, uh, OneDrive, Box.com also has enterprise accounts. Okay, that's good. Good to know. Uh, I hear another question is, uh, uh, what, what is the most effective method for understanding the types of data that's being stored and processed on a system? Like how, how does one that works in data protection and, and, and a side of privacy, how do we differentiate that? And, and, and how do we, I guess, try to understand those different types are classified. What, what are some tips, suggestions you have? Yes, and that's a huge effort and depends on the size of the company. So you would start with first data governance, create a data governance team to understand what data the company has, right? Or you personally, you know, just, uh, you know, do I guess an inventory of your data? Um, and then for the company it would be who is also responsible for the data. So first you do that analysis, the governance, the type of data that each business group has, and then you go into data classification. So um, you can use also some of those uh, regulations like GDPR and those frameworks to help you decide. For example, like what's considered PII as it just if it's just your name, but you don't have last name, birthday, none of that, is it really confidential, right? Or is a combination of all those, that information makes it, um, you know, confidential versus sensitive. So you have to create, you know, a metrics of all that with the use of uh, these frameworks. Um, something else, like we, we, we protect a lot of the PII and we protect a lot of PCI, but we also have to protect other confidential data that your business might have. Um, and the way to do that, once you have your, well, first you do data governance and then you do data classification and then next you have to do data tagging. Um, that's something else that you have to do because a, class of, a confidential document that does not have PII or PCI, it's still confidential, but the only way to know that it is confidential is by tagging it. So it was three different projects, three different efforts, each you know take a long time, but they're well worth it. But um, and that would be in the business. So for you, um, anything that um, a person can use to find your identity, you should protect it. Um, your personal data, your, your bank account information, even the paper stuff, you know, that sometimes we focus too much on technology and then we don't care too much about what's being delivered in the mail or how we dispose, you know, that, but you should also be very careful with, with all of that, your finances, um, all of that should be protected. Not just you, also your kids, you know, sometimes we forget about our kids as well. Yeah. So their information, yeah. And they're being targeted now because of that reason. So, so actually to piggyback on that comment, uh, that was something mm -hmm. I was thinking about earlier when we talked about protecting your data on social media. And, um, and when it comes to our children, so our, our kids, now, nowadays the young kids are, are at a younger age being exposed to the internet and the whole arena of cyber, something with cyber. So as, as parents, or maybe even as aunts and uncles, how do we help to ensure that the kids do not already have a digital life, that they don't really understand the magnitude that it can have on them as they get older to, to be more careful with that or help protect them? What are, what are some things that we can do proactively to, to address that so it doesn't get too bad for them by the time they're already of a certain age? 
Yes. And it's basic, I mean, the same thing that we're, do, that we're doing for us. Like if we are going to create an account for them, make sure that, you know, and I, I do this with my kids a lot, you know, they're in sports events and each website has their own. Actually with my son, my five-year-old, he was going to start playing flag football. And the, the coach is like, I need his original birth certificate. And then the coach got sick and he said, well, can you mail it? And I'm like, no, I'm not going to mail it, you know? Um, so then I went and dropped it off at his house. And then I'm like, well, what are you going to do with that? When are you going to give it back? So just be very conscious of, you know, the moves that you make when it comes to your kids. Something else that I would do, and um, it's also freeze their credit. I know this sounds a little crazy, but just freeze it. Make sure that nobody's creating you know, using their information to create accounts because they're not going to find out now. They'll probably find out, you know, when they're applying for, to buy their first house, they're going to find out there's something on their on their credit. So that's something else uh, to keep in mind. And then for the social media accounts, make sure they're using, um, well, I, th I don't think they can create it up to a certain age, but um, if they go into like YouTube or um, any other game, right, and your <coughs> phone is make sure that it's your account and not not theirs okay very, very good information that's that's actually uh, your your example reminded me of my example with my daughter where <laughs> they asked for me to send a copy of her birth certificate by email to their email like like well wait I, is it are you using encryption no or are you going to send me an encrypted link so i can upload it and i started questioning so okay we can just drop it off in the office like well i'm not going to just give you the birth certificate no so, and why are you asking only the girls? Why not the guys too? So, because my kids are, they start the same league. So why only the girls? So, yeah. So, I mean, of course, those are things that, that, um, that I want to be conscious of. And that's a very good point. Uh, the, another question here is, uh, so how, how important is it to ensure that only, that only the need to know access is granted to imported data? How do we evaluate that? So, uh, so what the need to know is um, one example in the, uh, you said on 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 me on like on our personal lives. Uh, if somebody's calling you, you know, and is asking for information, they're claiming to be from a company. Uh, just say, I don't I don't feel like you need to know this information. I'll call the company and find out what's going on myself, right? So make those evaluations, not because somebody's calling and questioning you. It means that you need to give it to them. Uh, something else, uh, when you fill out applications for whatever it is that you're doing, sometimes they ask for way too much information. Uh, for example, I went to a jewelry store and, you know, they're asking for birthdays, anniversaries, so they can send you coupons. But that information is optional. I don't think I need to give it right to every store I go to or, um, you know, every application on every business, right, that you come across. So just be, you know, very, very mindful of who you're sharing your, your data with. Like, you know, when you go to the schools, well, yes, you have to enroll your kids. You have to share that information with them. Just be careful how you share it with them. And then who they're going to share it with. Like, you know, just need to know. Only you need to know, but that other person does not need to know. So um, just, just make an evaluation of that. Um, let me think of something else. So at work, um, it is the same thing, you know, uh, all of our, our information should be confidential only if you decide to share it with somebody uh, like your birthday or um, where you live and things like that. So um, treat it, I always compare it with work. Like you wouldn't just share all this information at work. You shouldn't also do it in your in your personal life. Okay. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> All right. Um, and then here, uh, another question. Uh, uh, when it comes to our mobile devices, like, mm -hmm. like our Android devices and, I, and iOS devices, do you, do you consider like Android devices to be more or less secure compared to iOS devices? Or what are your thoughts on these two types of, of platforms? Yeah, so Android, I would say Android, Android and Windows are uh, probably um, where we see more of the vulnerabilities. And it's because, you know, um, there's a lot of open source. There's a lot of uh, ways that you can develop an app and deploy it. 
So, uh, but I wouldn't say it's it's more um, safe an iPhone than an Android when it comes to data protection because you're still giving right the data to all these companies. Um, you're still downloading apps and everything's being shared. So in that in that aspect, I think it's equally because I think it it comes from us, right? Like it's our actions or the apps that we download it and the information that we're providing. But uh, when it comes to software vulnerabilities, um, I would I would say um, probably iPhones are more safe. Okay. So just if, if if you don't mind, just to add to that also, um, like I know when it comes like if we're talking about like say uh, um, like a computer, so laptops, and we're talking about Windows and 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 Mac OS. Uh, generally, I would say you know Mac OS is probably not not as more secure, but there's less vulnerabilities because attackers target more windows since there's more windows devices out in the wild versus there are mac os now now recently uh, i think uh, apple just published uh, or they just patched them um, like many vulnerabilities in one of their latest updates or, or they're going to update uh, from a new one i forget i forget which one it was but but uh mac os attacks or, or vulnerabilities are, are being discovered more now because people are also moving more devices to the mac to the mac side but windows has been a bigger target uh because there's just more windows devices out there i guess in the same way with android devices and apple devices i'm not sure on the distribution of both but for being android being an open source in that in that part of the house versus the ios is more of a closed using the apple's proprietary software to build the apps then then open source is good for the community in, in developing, making it better, but it's also, uh, it can also be used in a maliciously by attackers to build these, these types of uh, modules or, or packages that can do things to, to our, to our, or to our phone. So, so there's kind of like pros and cons to both. You can, you can uh, sacrifice one thing to another, but it's more of a, it's, I think it's a preference thing on what device you use. Uh, me personally, I, I used uh, Android before, but it's uh but I, I like the feel of security i get better with the ios so i tend to use more and also because it's easier to to work with different integrations with other mac devices but uh but i think uh, i think it's a very good question because a lot of people uh some people have asked me hey what's better and i go well it depends you know how you're going to be using it how, how much do you know about what you do online and what you download and you browse so if you're very savvy in that then you can do pretty well on an android device where you may not run into many issues but if not then maybe an uh, an iphone uh, type ios device probably you know be a better if you want initial protection in that sense uh, <clears throat> so yeah uh, one question here um uh, trying to understand this one let me go on to the next one uh, oh what are some uh, specific roles. Actually, there's two questions here related to a similar topic. Uh, I'll see if I can combine them. So one question is really is asking about uh, specific roles in application development, security, or, or how how someone who's already a programmer uh, that's working towards application security uh, get into the into the field, I guess, of security development. I mean, uh, I'm guessing there's a component related to this with privacy. So how does one consider a privacy and data protection when you're already a programmer going into that field of, of application security development? So, so that's how I started in application development. So I was doing, believe it or not, I was coding. I'm a coder, you guys. I know I wear all this stuff, but awesome. I, 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 I started in application development, programming, building applications for um, a power company. So when you're coding, you're also learning about secure code, right? So, and also I had gone to school for security. So if you take training in secure coding um, and security best practices when it comes to coding, it'll be easier to do the transition from application development into application security. Because uh, application security, they work with the development teams as hand by hand. So you're doing, you know, code reviews, you're doing, um, uh, code, you know, testing of the applications. So it's probably a stuff that you're already doing and you might not even be aware. Uh, but if you if you want to just, you know, take some training and then you said I've done, you know, um, secure coding practices training, then you can use that and then do the transition into security. 
Now, with, with data protection, uh, something that's going to be really hot, it's going to be uh, privacy engineering. So knowing about all the regulations, you know, the ones that are already in place and then the ones that are going to be coming this year and then the years to come, if you have the technical knowledge and then you have the, that expertise that is also that is also very valuable. And then the technical knowledge includes not just application development, but knowing like architecture and, and all that good stuff. So that's another good combination. Okay. So you might not have to do too much to transition into um, application security. Okay. Uh, I just want to take a quick note really quick. Um, uh, I just launched our CSMP poll. I meant to launch it earlier and I forgot. So I just turned it on right now. For those of you that are still on with us, if you have a moment, please uh, do that uh, the poll. And um, I know we're about three minutes over, so uh, got to give the attendees maybe a few minutes to to do this. Do you have time for another one or two questions? Yes, yes, of yep. course. Okay, all right. Uh, let's see. Um, so, so here. Okay, so one, one question is: uh, Do you have any suggestions for best practices to handle a data a data breach? Uh, will be a, a way to approach that. So. Um, one of the thing is you have to first review what type of data, right? Um, the type of data that was leaked and the amount of it. Um, and then from there, once you do the evaluation, you also have to find out like how the data left the company because you have to put um, work on remediation. But then the next thing is working with the legal team. So you have to work with the data um, the data privacy officer. And then usually for us, that's, that's you know, most companies, legal team would handle those, those data breaches. They would, they would work with the regulatory companies. Um, some companies also have the, the media team because depending on how, how big the breach is, we might have to maybe on the news. And then you have to also let the customers know. So that would be another step. But before you even do all that, you have to do an evaluation. And only the legal team, the data privacy officer, can call it a data breach. So cybersecurity you know, can report the findings. The legal is the one that, um, that actually you know, makes the call. So yes. they always tell us to be very careful. Do never use that. Even me saying it makes me a little nervous. Don't make the word data breach. Don't use the word data breach. Only the legal team can can call it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's important to keep to know that for for your job because yeah. that could <laughs> that can cause some repercussions that you don't intend. Uh, okay. Good. Um, our another question here. Um, so what are some methods to determine whether or not your personal information was compromised in a data breach? So, um, so there are some sites where you can, you can see, yeah, I guess you can check for your email. Uh, you can check, um, but for your data, just to look for your data. Uh, and I can think of. Reynaldo, maybe you can help me with this one. Yes. Yeah, there's one actually. I, I check it often. It's called Have I Been Pwned? Yes. Pwned, okay, pwned. Yeah, uh, uh, I think it's, uh, I, I think I, uh, if you do a quick search, a Google search, you'll get the right URL. So, but it's called uh, Have I Been Pwned? Uh, I think it's uh, .com. There's a few different ones, but that's that's one that, that you can check and you enter your email address. And it will give you results of any data breach that's ha that's been known already that's happened. Uh, I'm not sure how far it goes, yep. but it tells you the organization or the company that had the data breach and what kind of information was obtained from that data breach. Uh, when I did a search for mine, I found that I was part of three data breaches. And one of them was related to uh, a service that I had used uh, similar similar to like uh, like meetup like meetup like like events where you do events that kind of thing but it's one i signed up for like many years ago that i i used maybe once or twice and my information was part of that breach but then the other two i found happened to be through third parties that are involved with marketing and some kind of information that they buy from some somewhere where my information was sold uh to them uh so that's something that that you want to be aware of and, and, and look at. So 
Um, so the have been have I been pwned is one of the ways to to check that, and there's a few other ones, but that's a, a good one to check kind of where it's where your information has been compromised. So I recommend checking that maybe once every couple of weeks or a month, just kind of see how it is. But uh, but that would be uh, that would be one good example. Also on your phone, your iPhone. So if you check, um, I think it gives you some information. I don't know about the Androids, but if you go to the settings and I believe it's in passwords, it gives you some security recommendations. I'm just looking at it right now. And then based on the accounts, hopefully you're not saving your passwords on your phone, but if you are, it, I'll, it'll give you some information. And if you have a password locker, It'll also give you, based on the accounts that you put in there, it'll give you some information too. Just to add a little to what Reynaldo was suggesting. Awesome. Uh, all right. So I know we're, uh, there's a lot of good questions. It's a lot of questions people posted on the Q&A and also on the chat. Um, we won't be able to get to all of them. Uh, we're, we're eight uh, past, uh, past <clears throat> excuse me, eight past the hour. And uh, <clears throat> I want to be mindful also of Carolina's time and really uh, thank everyone for, for joining us in this event. Uh, we look forward to hosting more events uh, for CSNP and uh, really appreciate uh, Carolina your time for, no for this presentation and to all the attendees that joined us. Um, uh, for sure, you get to all the questions, but hopefully you know, we can do that also with, with future events. Well, thank you so much and thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. And I hope I, I was useful for, you know, yes. the audience. <laughs> That's very good. All right. Thank you everyone for joining and everyone have a good uh, rest of the night. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.